Thanks for joining us today for LDI's virtual seminar on addressing social needs to improve health. I'm sure as you all know, addressing social determinants of health has become a very common topic in conversations about how to improve health and healthcare delivery. And this focus has stemmed from a couple of different things. First, over the years, there has been an accumulation of consistent and very compelling evidence that social determinants shape individuals' health, and that if we as a society are going to seriously um, undertake the goal of improving population health, it will depend at least in part on addressing these social determinants. Second, at the same time, this evidence base is combined with increasing pressures over the past decade to increase the value of health care that we deliver in this country or deliver higher quality of care at a lower cost. There has been a slow but steady shift toward what we call value-based purchasing or the way that the health sector thinks about how we pay for care. And we have started to make more payments that pay explicitly for health rather than healthcare delivery. In combination, these factors have resulted in the health care system paying more attention to upstream factors that affect health and addressing these social determinants of health. And the relevance of these issues has only grown as we've lived through the pandemic with the terrible disparities that we have seen. The disproportionate effect of the pandemic on disadvantaged communities has been a stark reminder of the relationships between social well-being and health. But in considering how the healthcare system should address these social determinants, a number of important questions arise. There is the difficult reality that we often have entirely separate systems that are designed to meet people's health needs and people's social needs which raises the question of how best to integrate social care with health care. There's questions of what kinds of infrastructure would be required to facilitate such activities, including data and data systems, and questions of how we should finance and pay for this care. And there is perhaps an even bigger question, which is we do agree that social determinants must be addressed to improve health. Whose responsibility is it to do so? The healthcare sector, the social services sector, another stakeholder, or some combination of those? The imperative to examine and address social health needs together has never been greater, and there's a lot to talk about, so I'm especially pleased to welcome our panel today. First, we have Jorge Delva, who is the Dean of the Boston University School of Social Work and the Director of the Center for Innovation in Social Work and Health, which works to expand the impact of social work to improve the health and well-being of vulnerable populations. Carolyn Fitchenberg is the Managing Director of the Social Interventions Research and Evaluation Network, or SIREN, which is at the University of California at San Francisco, and it focuses um, on reducing health inequities by addressing social determinants of health. Kathleen Noonan uh, is the CEO of the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers, a coalition that implements interventions and pilots new models of care that elevate the health of patients facing the most complex medical and social challenges. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, Caroline, I want to start with a question for you. So there's a continuum of ways in which we can integrate health and human services, from healthcare providers screening for social risk and referring those in need to social services, to health and human services activities that actually take place in tandem through jointly funded uh, programs with healthcare delivery systems. I wanted to start by asking you to describe that continuum of integration um, and give us a little bit of an overview of the evidence for integration of social services with healthcare across that continuum. Great, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, so yeah, it, I find it useful to kind of um, think of uh, various activities along this continuum. So one of the activities that um, is I think one of the most common things that's happening right now is screening um for social needs in uh clinical settings so we're seeing a lot of that a lot of different forms and it's kind of one of the first ways of kind of bringing information about that part of patients lives into the clinical setting um the it, and that's also one of the areas i think in some ways where there's the most evidence uh, because it's the place where people have begun um and so i think we have the most research so far on that a few things that come out of that um, are that um, on balance, it seems that patients find it pretty acceptable to be asked about social risks in the clinical setting, as long as it's done in a way that um, feels, uh, doesn't feel targeted, doesn't feel like anybody's being targeted uh, or, or you know, stereotyped in any way, and that there's a sense of comfort uh, um, and trust um, with that. Um, and so, and we're gradually learning more about the different ways that that can be done. 
Um, I would say the next uh, uh, type of activity along that continuum is uh, activities to refer people to services or navigate them to services, whether internal services or external services. Um, here, the evidence is um, it's still growing. Um, I would say um, it seems uh, so far that there's um, so you know we're learning more about the best better better ways to do that. Um, there is it's clear that it's possible to do and that you can connect people to services. Who should be doing it? What's the best way to do it? One of the areas that's gotten a lot of interest recently are technologies to do this. Um, so kind of off the shelf tool that um, health system can pay for that, you know, allows um, uh, individuals to search for relevant services and then electronically refer patients uh, to those services. I think that's one area where there's been huge uptake um, and not yet much evidence about how effective that can be. So that's an area with a need for more um, for more research for sure. Um, uh, further along that continuum is the actual provision of services to meet needs, um, which can take the place of kind of, you know, uh, health organizations themselves providing that. So um, we have food pantries and healthcare settings, we have medical legal partnerships, um, we have services embedded, in other words, in clinical settings, and then we also have um, instances of uh, health organizations, payers, and providers paying for services. Um, some uh, very concrete examples of that are things like medically tailored meals or other home delivered meals. And that's one of the areas actually where there's been some really good evidence coming out recently in some uh, rigorous studies about the benefits of that, both in terms of health and uh, utilization impacts. Um, housing is another place where we see this a fair amount. Um, the housing evidence is really complex um, and, and still growing as well. Um, transportation is another area where we're seeing this, a fair amount of this. Um, and surprisingly, relatively little data there as well yet. Um, then there's a whole other set of strategies um, and types of efforts that um, are more at the community level. Um, so, um, for example, we have uh, efforts where health systems are um, joining forces with other organizations in the you know in their community to try to tackle a big problem like homelessness or. Uh, readiness to enter kindergarten or those kinds of efforts. Uh, there's a lot less evidence there. It's a lot more complicated to study. Um, anchor strategies is another one that I want to highlight. Uh, this is where health systems think of the role that they play, intentionally think about the way in which they can improve health in their community through their hiring practices and their employment practices and their purchasing practices. Very little evidence there yet. Um, uh, and then a final one I want to highlight is around advocacy and policy change related to social factors, uh, which is, I think, a role that was highlighted in the National Academy of Medicine report that came out uh, a year and a half ago um, and is one that I hope we get to talk a little bit more about in this conversation because I think it doesn't get enough attention. And let me just ask one follow up question to that, if you don't mind. In the the many different ways that you've outlined about it, in trying to integrate health and human services together. Um, what are some of the challenges that we face that we have to overcome in trying to do that? You know, one of them is this is very new. This uh, very few people in the healthcare sector, I think, with the exception of social workers, uh, have trained, um, uh, uh, have been taught much about um, these other needs that people have um, besides health care needs. Um, so it, there's a big learning curve, um, I think, in the healthcare sector. Um, I think um, there are, um, you know, challenges of uh, two sectors coming together that have different languages, different cultures, different ways of operating um, that, that make it, you know, hard to at first to figure out how to work best together. And then I think one of the other ones um, that that is challenging is that um, uh, and probably more challenging for the human services sector than for the healthcare sector, but but I think that ultimately is going to uh, affect the healthcare sector is that a lot of this is being driven by the healthcare side. So it's the healthcare side that has kind of, as you mentioned, kind of woken up to the importance of social factors and people's uh, for people's health. Um, and so and and the healthcare sector is a sector that ha you know generally has has more resources 
Um, and so a lot of this is being driven by healthcare sector priorities and needs, um, which um, uh, creates some issues in terms of, you know, there's more of a focus on the places that lead to more, um, that are associated with higher healthcare costs, um, which means, for example, that maybe um, there's not as much a focus on children, because children generally are not where we have the biggest healthcare costs um, in this country. We're focusing more on, high, high, you know, high cost um, users, but uh, but making, you know, social factors matter tremendously in the long term over the life course for children um, and ensuring um, the environment for children to thrive and develop um, uh, appropriately um, is incredibly important in the long run. So I think there are these kind of misaligned incentives when the 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 um, this work is driven primarily by healthcare priorities as opposed to a blend of healthcare and uh, human services sector priorities. I'll stop there because I'm sure we'll talk more about this. That is an important issue and I hope we talk a lot more about it. Before we do that, I want to move um, to Kathleen and ask you some of your experience. So the Camden Coalition um, for the audience serves a population with great health and social needs across the river from the University of Pennsylvania in South Jersey. Uh, can you describe the coalition's approach to meeting the needs of that community and the biggest challenges you faced in that work? So our approach, we really started doing work with a multidisciplinary care team back in 2007. Um, and that care team includes a community health worker and a nurse, LPN or RN paired up with a social worker that they are consulting with. From the beginning, we've always thought that that interdisciplinary inter set of experiences is really important. Um, we also, although our RCT was focused on readmission and emergency room use, um, work with patients around 16 domains of care or 16 domains. I mean, we don't actually talk about it that, that way with them. We have this sort of fun cards that we use to actually talk with them about what's most important to them. And to us, uh, if seeing their kids that they haven't seen is most important to them, that's what we work on. Um, and so that's always been our approach. It's very person-centered. It's very um, focused on well-being. Um, I think the other thing to say is that we've always had this sort of individual approach, but at the same time, a system level of what we need to be building while we're doing that. And although our care intervention is focused on the most complex, the system level pieces actually get to some of those people who you're just screening, right? That may be just at, at, at not as high a need as our as our population. So um, in 2010, we created a health information exchange because we knew, um, you know, Epic would, would be down the, you know, come down the lane and is now, but at the time our hospitals couldn't see each other's data. And that has resulted in a system now where it's really more, we're really more focused on linking health and non-health um, providers. Um, with the right consents, of course. And then I know Aunt Bertha and now POW are now, you know, being talked about. In 2015, we created uh, our own label with Aunt Bertha um, and have been doing that for a long time. And I can tell you it's very hard. And I'm not surprised the evidence is not in on that yet. Um, so our approach is really individual and system. Uh, the uh, issues, I will, you know, Carolyn, everything you said, ditto. Um, Fragmentation, 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 the fragmentation of these systems and the lack of governance rules, right? The lack of governance rules about who's in charge is really important. And that's very difficult when you have federal rules, state rules, local rules, and who even gets to tell who what to do is something that we need a lot more work in. Um, governance is one of RWJF's pillars in their alignment strategy. So we know that that's out there and people are thinking about that. Um, lack of support for some people in perpetuity. We just love a program that begins and ends. And there are some people who need some help all the time. And we don't really want to grapple with that because it's, it goes against our, you know, we can fix people and then we're done. But our Housing First program is a much lighter touch intervention, but we check in with people at least once a month. I mean, they've graduated from our program, but we make sure that, you know, all is going OK. And there are some people that just may need that kind of light touch. Um, third issue is just investment in primary care. You know, our starry eyes when the ACA passed and what we thought primary care might be has not really come to be yet. 
Um, integration in primary care has not happened. Um, I'll let Jorge talk about um, licensed clinical social workers and lack of integration, I think, of them really in the health setting. Um, and then behavioral health, behavioral health, behavioral health. I mean, while we talk about social determinants and the health systems around food and transportation, I think we're really missing the conversation around behavioral health and what hasn't been invested in, in a place where really I think is closer to the health systems knitting than food or housing or transportation. So I'll stop there. You did bring up the randomized control trial. Um, as a little bit of background for people who may not follow this as closely as you do, in 2014, um, a group of researchers partnered with the Camden Coalition with a very commendable goal of creating some evidence around what you do and being open to the idea that this is a testable hypothesis and um, began enrolling people uh, to test um, identifying super utilizers of care to see whether or not it could, um, that intervention would decrease uh, rehospitalizations within, I believe, three months and reduce costs. And so over four, uh, four years, I believe the coalition uh, enrolled about 800 patients to a random, to a usual care arm versus this more intensive care arm. Um, and the results were published last January, uh, showing that there wasn't a significant difference in rates of rehospitalization between those two arms. So maybe you could just give us a little bit of context about that trial, how you think about it um, in terms of the work that you do um, and what it means for, uh, for that, for you. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, I love to say this just because I took the position of CEO of the Camden Coalition in 2018 and I did not know the results of the trial, although I knew from uh, people inside the coalition that there was a sense that we were going to show no effect because of adaptations that we had to make along the way. Um, and I can talk more about those. Um, we did show a statistically significant difference in terms of uptake of SNAP benefits right, in our intervention arms. So that's something to think about at some point. Um, but I think that um, for us, what, what we learned is that there were many barriers that we hit while we were rolling out the intervention. Um, and each time we hit a barrier, we tried to address it. Um, one barrier was we couldn't get primary care appointments as quickly as we thought we could for people who were actually being discharged from the hospital. So in our smaller in our smaller sets of work, we were able to do that with a much larger population. We actually had to create a citywide effort called the Seven Day Pledge and got all 14 primary care sites in Camden to agree to hold slots for patients, Medicaid patients who were leaving the hospital and get them enrolled within seven days. We did publish on that and show a statistically significant difference for those patients, but it was for the, the less complex patients. So for even for our patients in that study, that citywide effort sort of wasn't sufficient for them. Um, we also adapted and created a Housing First program because we just found that um, we couldn't stabilize people if they were in unstable housing. Um, and that we started about two years into the intervention. And the last thing I think that's really important is that um, we created a medical legal partnership I and mean, we weren't able to get that off the ground until after the study closed. Um, and our medical legal partnership is a lot different than other medical legal partnerships because we actually get really into the weeds on fines and fees issues and not just public benefit issues or eviction issues, but we found that for a lot of our patients, they had old fines and fees, civil issues that turned into criminal issues, and we worked alongside uh, criminal attorneys if necessary to help our clients so that we could get them housing. They literally couldn't get housing until this other stuff was cleared up. So those are some of the things that we were working on, didn't fully have implemented until after the intervention, and that we're continuing to sort of hone. Um, and I would say that those are pieces that are both geared to the population, but also developing like the regional ecosystem around our patients, but then around also patients who are just at risk. Great, thanks. Um, I wanna bring Jorge into this conversation. Uh, Caroline, in her introductory remarks, mentioned the important role of social workers and the training they have in trying to help um, address the social determinants of health. 
Your center, the Center for Innovation in Social Work and Health, notes that over half of the 650,000 social workers across the country are embedded in health systems. How have health systems used this workforce to address social needs? And uh, I'd lo would love to hear a little bit about what you think is working well and what's not working very well in this model. Thank you, and um, thank you very much for having me here. Uh, first of all, it's important to note that there isn't one model, right? There's there, the, the complexity and the uh, breadth of the diversity of services and, and, and places where social workers are located is considerable. So there's tremendous variation between, between settings. But in many of these settings, social workers play a real key role. You know, they, they serve to address not only the barriers from what we usually focus on discharge from, for example, inpatient stays, but also help identify barriers that exist against access and care. A key and additional area of social workers can help with is they help destigmatize the fact that people that have the what we call complex needs, they, they are complex because there is not just medical, they have a experience in an array of health social uh, challenges that while they may not have health insurance or access to adequate housing, education, and nutrition, for example, and they bear the burdens of these uh, circumstances, they're not the cause. They're, they're on the side of experiencing the impact. So social workers bring to the table a perspective that reminds us, for those of us who sometimes forget or haven't paid attention, that there has been a system that has purposely and historically, systematically passed policies, enacted policies, and programs that disenfranchise certain communities. So when we're working with individuals and families and communities that have these complex uh, medical needs, that we use words such as social determinants of health, we're really looking into a system that has systematically, over time, ignored, at best, purposely attack certain communities to create the environment they live in. And social workers bring that perspective. And I think by bringing that perspective, it helps uh, destigmatize and hopefully help people open their minds of, as to the humanity of individuals we're working with. Now, uh, many individuals, many disciplines also have this perspective, but this is at the core of the social work uh, education and profession. Now, despite social workers' potentials, we're not the most empowered in these settings. And too often, social workers are placed under other professions. And despite the healthcare world recently discovering social determinants of health and that social workers can play a key role, their roles still remain poorly understood. And, and this always surprises me when I hear social workers tell me they work in a settings where they say, I've been working here for 20 years, and uh, colleagues from another profession still scratch their heads about what, what, I, what we as social workers exactly do. And that is for us to improve. I think that needs to change. Uh, also, in too many cases, social workers are not staffed in a way that each patient will have access to a social worker. I've experienced this myself when we've been uh, seeking health care for myself and my family. I've seen this, uh, observed it through my own interactions. Um, and it seems that in general that only those programs where there is a requirement of licensing, such as ICUs or behavioral health, then there are 100% referrals to social work. But what that reflects is that social determinants of health it's still new, it's still not central to the mission of medical systems of care, but rather perhaps in some cases a perceived distraction from the original mission. Although lately one uh, increasingly hears, we, I love social workers, we want more social workers, I couldn't do it without social workers. The reality still has to catch up to that perception, including more social work leadership at the highest levels of, a, of an organization would certainly help organizations shape the integration of care. As someone said, and I can't take credit for this quote, and I can't quite remember who said it, but it says, oh, we can't do health care without social care, and we can't do social care without social work. Great. Uh, that's a great quote. Thank you. Um, so I want to follow up with a question um, 
about what this what a true partnership might look like. And so, Hori, you you've described very eloquently the importance of having a partnership between social workers and healthcare providers. I'm, I want to ask all of you uh, when you think about whose responsibility it is to address social needs, or what a, the best version of this partnership might look like. Uh, who you think, how you think that partnership should should exist? Whose role really is it to address social social needs? So, uh, I'm happy to start with you, Jorge, um, and then we can go around the virtual room. Sure, thank you. And I get passionate about this topic, as you can see. So, if I'm uh, start rambling or I'm taking over, please interrupt me. <laughs> um, well, this question too is addressing a special issue of the Journal of Health Affairs. It's volume 39. For those of you who are interested, you can Google Health Affairs volume 39 and there is a, a nice list of articles there that actually Caroline also worked on. Um, uh, there also is the, which was referred to earlier, the National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine Consensus Study Report published in 2019 on the topic of integrating social care into the delivery of health care. So if you Google NASEM, N-A-S-E-M, integrating social care into the del delivery of health care, you'll have access to it. But to answer the question, I say we're, we're far from integration. Uh, in a profit-driven system, despite the SEA, healthcare is still operating in ways that many uh, value social worker services, but can't figure out how to get them paid within existing, existing reimbursement mechanisms. In too many cases, social work is used as a cost center rather than an essential part of care needed to ensure equitable and optimal healthcare outcomes. Now, in behavioral health, it is billed for, but usually at a lower rate. Now, there are some examples of systems that have integrated innovative social service uh, cares provided by social workers and community health workers, but that's still um, a growing area that we need to attend to in part because we are, I think we have a, even the, the questions we're discussing today, very important questions, but they reflect a, 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 our attempt to put band-aids to a patchwork of healthcare that we have in the United States. I mean, when I hear descriptions of providing legal care, housing care, food pantries, all important, and we should because they help meet a need, I can't help but wonder why isn't society providing those? Why is the burden falling in, in the healthcare system, in hospitals, right, or, or other system? That should be a response, a larger response. It's honorable that systems have stepped in to try to help, but the, the the bottom line is why are we as a society not have the political will, the imagination, right, to pursue uh, policies and programs where people don't go hungry, where people have access to proper housing, affordable housing, where there's universal health care, where uh, education is accessible to all. We've seen how COVID has been devastating for the, the world, but overwhelmingly for certain communities where children are not attending schools and we are learning, just beginning to learn the data showing the mental health impact that's going to have on people. All of that is going to fall on the health, on a hospital, on a clinic, on the social service agency. That's that's like too much for anyone, right? And that's where I think as a society, as a country, we need to look beyond the important questions we're asking, but say, oh, why aren't we doing better? And I think there's hope. Uh, there's hope, and we're working towards that. But um, you know, to be, in terms of building partnerships. And I'll stop after, if, you, if I may have one more minute, please. Um, they, the time, the, some of the barriers are time, money, and I would argue humility. We, one sector tends to have a more a, a perspective of, uh, we, we know it all, we know most of it, and it takes time to learn from one another. It takes time to outreach communities and, and learn better. And it takes, I think, a sense of humility because we are complicit in the world we have we have created uh, within organizations. The there is a general lack of social workers in more prominent roles. They usually rise up to a certain level, but they're not part of the larger, the higher ups who are making the bottom line decisions about services and reward systems. So, 
moving more social workers into those positions would bring additional diverse perspectives that I think would help the, the conversation we're having about viewing the world differently and, and viewing ways of, of collaborating differently that in the end helps the people that we're all trying to, to better help. Great, thank you. Uh, Caroline, tell us whose problem this is to solve from where you sit. So uh, I have to say that I, I agree a lot with Jorge. Um, you know, this is all of our problems to solve. Uh, what we're seeing is that um, the, the health, health is one of the places where we see the impacts of, um, of under-investing in uh, meeting uh, our, our uh, countries, in particular our most vulnerable um, uh, amongst us basic needs. Um, and so it plays out in health, it also plays out in education, it plays out in other sectors as well. Um, but that's one of the places, it's, it's one of our you know, biggest expenditures, it's um, increasingly crowding out other things in state budgets, et cetera. So it's one of the places where I think there's the most pressure right now. Um, so I, I think that there's a, um, it's everybody's role. Um, the, the, the role that the healthcare sector can play, um, I mean, I think, in one sense, no matter what, even if we, you know, I think the move towards the integration and thinking about how social and economic factors play into health is hopefully one that we keep for a long term because as Kathy mentioned, it's that's what whole person care is, right? You can't, you know, I think it's that realization that, that your health is intricately linked to all these other things in your life. And the more we can uh, create systems of care that, that um, are holistic in that way and person-centered in that way, better it is. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the, the um, and right now, I, I, you know, I think that there, um, there will be different versions of that. I think in the longer term, um, the idea, I, I don't think the goal is that the healthcare sector all of a sudden becomes the provider of housing, the provider of food, the provider of transportation. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Um, I think it's filling the gap, as um, as Jorge mentioned, that is there, um, and um, and there are unique places for the healthcare sector, I think, to play that role, um, particularly for um, individuals with complex health and social needs. Um, the the other piece I think that's really important is the role that the healthcare sector can play in pointing out these connections. And working both at the community level and at policy levels to change policies and systems, to advocate for things like living wage, to advocate for things like the child benefit that's being talked about um, on the Hill um, these days, to advocate for greater investments um, and more uh, systems change for affordable housing. Um, the, I think it's important to think um, uh, healthcare. Um, Players have a lot of political capital. They're people that, that people listen that are listened to a lot, um, and there's a whole other role there. I think that is underutilized so far um, in highlighting the systems changes that are needed um, and helping to build political will for them. Um, uh, in addition to doing the on the ground work of as much as possible creating systems of whole person and person centered care. Great, thanks. Kathleen. Yeah, I won't repeat what my um, colleague said, which I totally agree with. And um, I do think that right now, um, I think that this is a public policy issue, meaning an issue that requires public um, solutions by sort of public bodies that have the ability to make public policy. I think right now, a lot of the work that's being done is actually being done in what I would call private policy context, meaning a hospital is actually deciding what it's gonna do. And that's private policy, and that's great. Some of it's very helpful, but it's not actually guided by public policy decisions. In fact, if you look at most hospitals' community health needs assessments, transportation and food is not high on their list. It's all these other things, and that's one place where we actually have required them to, to say, it is in some places, Carol, and I agree with you, but I just mean behavioral health is almost always up there as the top one. Um, and there are a few other top 
winners and then you have some access issues that get to transportation and that kind of thing. But the point is, is that um, this is a very complicated public policy issue. You know, are we going to tell hospitals what to do? That's not an, that's not simple. And we're not even at the we don't even have enough evidence to even back a decision to say here hospital, this is what you should do. Um, and so I think as we're trying to sort of gather that evidence base, it's going to be somewhat difficult, right? Because we have a lot of private policy solutions happening in in a context where we don't have yet the public policy that says this is sort of what we are going to require as a minimum. And again, I can't emphasize enough that without governance rules around who's, you know, how does public health interact with the health system, interact with the community-based organizations at the local level, and um, how how the that those decisions get made. Does the state mandate something? The federal government has loath to mandate that under any type, you know, red, blue administration, it doesn't matter. We really believe in local difference. So how all of that's going to happen is going to take some time, but this is a public policy issue. And so I ultimately look at our policymakers as the ones that have to figure out um, how to solve some of these issues. Um, so we're getting a lot of great questions from the audience. Um, I want to bring one in now, which is about evidence, which I think Kathleen is very much related to what you were just saying, is how do we, you know, policymakers want often, not always, some evidence of success. The comments you made about the randomized controlled trial not showing evidence of decreased readmissions um, could be interpreted as lack of success, but maybe actually it was a success in other ways. And so the question is about thinking about the difference between statistical significance between uh, versus a practical significance. I might also add, like, what are the right outcomes that we should be measuring to call something a success? I wonder if um, uh, any of you want us to take that question? Um, so it, this is the, this is a, a a question I think that has lots of different um, different pieces that are part of it. Um, I you know in general yes I think the reverence for statistical significance um, it, you know we place that on a pedestal that is way too high compared to where we put practical significance, so there's no question that, you know, that's a problem that continues to be the case. Um, you know, in the c case of that particular study, like there really was like no, in the that in the, the Camden Coalition study, and Kathleen, please correct me if I'm wrong, because it's been a while since I looked at it, but looking just at readmissions, there just wasn't really a difference between the two groups. It would here practical and, and statistical were aligned. But I think as Kathleen pointed out, this goes to this other question of, well, what outcomes matter? Um, and um, and I think that was one of the, I think, um, maybe regrets of that RCT is that it focused only on readmissions and didn't look at other things. Um, and there may have been other things that have improved, et cetera. Um, you know, this is always a challenge in terms of um, evidence. Um, RCTs are uh justifiably the the um the gold standard in terms of evidence but they all have a lot of limitations in the sense that you have to have a really you know you ideally have a, a completely consistent intervention um and they're, they're hard to apply to things that they're much easier to apply to something that's a pill that you give than they are to something that in, involves interaction between individuals where there's always going to be some uh, uh, you know modification in how you work with people etc um and and so you know I think we continue to basically a range of evidence. Um, RCTs um, are really important, and we we have to apply them more and more. I think, um, and at the same time, know that there are accumulation of other types of evidence also helps uh, us identify what works. Um, and you know. Um, Finding the balance between those um, is a work in progress, um, and there aren't any kind of, I don't think, it, I think it's very hard to have very fixed rules about that um, going forward. I'll add one more thing on kind of the evidence piece right now is that 
Um, I think there is there have been a few questions in there about like how much is this happening, et cetera. This is happen. Um, how much are when I say is this happening? How much are healthcare organizations and payers doing? Um, you know, paying for for transportation and food, et cetera. This is happening a lot, uh, a lot more than we're seeing in the literature. Um, and so, um, or in the, the academic literature at least. Um, and so in terms of our learning in this area, one of the things that I wish we could do and have more of is more of the sharing of the learning, uh, the, you know, all of the private payers that are trying this out. You know, I know United Health Care has been doing a lot around housing. Um, and, you know, what are they learning? I'm sure they're learning tons. Um, you know, Humana and Kaiser, and I'm just naming a few, are all trying different things and not that much of that learning, I think, always ends up in the literature. Um, and so we, we need more sharing of of what people are learning, regardless of the, the way in which it is being um, it is being generated. Yeah, so you mentioned the funding issue, which is coming up in the Q&A's a bit, which uh, another way to interpret the questions is how do we pay for this? And so there are, you've cited a number of examples of uh, commercial insurers uh, experimenting with paying for addressing social determinants of health. Uh, there's a question about whether Medicaid waivers should be used, um, other ways in which the federal government could intervene. I wonder if any of you could give some comments about um, where the funding comes, how the funding in our current healthcare system, which is already quite large in terms of funding, uh, should be reallocated to address social. I wonder, Kathleen, if you want to share kind of how you guys think about it. Or do yeah. It in the yeah. Yeah. Sure. I I defer to you on the research, so I think it's fair that I can. Uh, I'll take this one, which is um. Uh, you know, we don't really talk about reallocation at this point. I just I don't think that we are at. I, th I think that it's premature to have that conversation. I think that um, um, we we do still believe that um, there is savings to be had, especially with these very, very complex patients. If you can figure out uh, the, the model, um, which we're still trying to figure out um, uh, of um, how do you help these patients who are cycling in and out, um, you know, in admissions? Um, but a, a reallocation strategy at this point is just not what we're thinking about. What we're really thinking about more on the ground level is how do you get all these players to communicate together? How do you get them to even think about joint care planning between community-based organizations and hospital caseworkers and social workers? Um, and um, the reallocation really will have to come naturally if some of the prevention work, that kind of work, um, happens. But reallocation right now is just, we're so far away from that. It's just not, uh, you know, it's not that we're no comment, but we just think it's just premature. Jorge, a question for you. So you have talked about um, social workers not being integrated into health system in an optimal way. Um, somebody asked a question uh, about, uh, mentioned that community health workers, which is another approach to addressing social determinants of health, often face similar challenges. What are your thoughts on the best way to address improving the integration of uh, workers who directly address social determinants of health into care delivery? And also yes, we, make a difference as you as you point yeah. out. Yeah. Oh, be, before answering, I think that it, it's it's obvious that part of the social work perspective is to uh, ver lies very strongly on addressing uh, inequalities and on you know, looking at the, the essentially upstream or social determinant of health at the core, at the very core of our structures. Um, and later, if I have a chance, I'll, I'd like to say a little bit more about that. But looking at the, and, 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 and therefore, I'm sort of asking the question a little, a different, slightly different with the question that we're saying, how can we address this current problem? But the question pertains more at addressing a larger societal problem. Um, the community health workers, they're, they're, are, are an integral uh, aspect of um, providing, um, helping with healthcare, with public health, and improving population health, along with with social workers. And I think 
there's been a, a, a disconnect, right? The same way that social workers embedded in a, in a larger system have been, uh, there's been struggle recognizing. There's a little bit less of a struggle recognizing how uh, community health workers who are embedded in their communities can help translate, can help connect. But I know of, of, of community health workers that are, um, you know, some, there's an attitude by in many professions where they can't supervise themselves. So we have to have a, a an established older profession supervising them, or or uh, they're seriously underpaid. And so it's 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 the same question. Social workers struggling to find its value and therefore have uh, have more proper proper compensation. Community health workers are struggling with that. Um, how how do social workers and community health workers best work together? How did best work together with the other professions? Are all uh, nascent questions that actually I think are, are beginning to be addressed. In part, you may have heard that this National Association of Community Health Workers was formed this past year, and um, uh, we are that through the center we have um, having we organize a group of social workers and community health workers from across the country that we're meeting monthly, having exactly these conversations. We don't quite have an answer yet, but we're working towards having an, um, specific questions that as a group we want to tackle and that we want to use that to then hopefully inform health systems, hospitals, and others um, on how best to um, in a positive way, utilize the knowledge that both social workers and community health workers bring, and that we bring in a, in a togetherness way, not paired against each other, as it, it it's, um, has been the case in, in in recent years. So that's speaking of evidence. That's um, uh, there's there's evidence of the effectiveness of the professions. There's less evidence of how we can work together, how we can work together better within these larger systems and. Some of our work and the work of others, we're hoping to be able to contribute to the literature and be able to use what we learned with the, through our com conversations to inform best practices. I want to turn to the question of um, uh, technology and data and data integration and talk a little bit about where we stand today with those issues. Um, I imagine that data and data integration could be very helpful. Um, and uh, so I'd like to hear where where what your experience with that is and where we should be heading and uh, thinking about that. Um, Carolyn, do you want to go first? Uh, sure. I mean, I think the big need uh, with data integration is um, the creating systems that enable the integration, obviously, of data from the healthcare side and data from human services side. Um, there are a lot of efforts to do that. We're seeing, you know, places are testing out different ways of doing that. Um, but this is the piece, right? Just as, you know, in the healthcare setting, there's this idea of, oh, we need to, we want to ask our patients about these, need, you know, these needs, um, that we need to extend that at the system level. Um, I think one of the big challenges there is that um, uh, the human services sector is, has been, you know, historically under-resourced. Um, and has um, on balance, uh, you know, really um, uh, not, you know, low capacity in terms of technology. Um, and I think, um, you know, one of the things that might be needed is something like the High Tech Act that we had in the healthcare sector. I mean, it took federal investment, um, substantial federal investment to get the healthcare sector to, uh, uh, you know, to really electronify um, all of its uh, data, um, and we know that that wasn't perfect and that there are issues with that, um, but I think we may need a similar kind of investment on the human sector side um, uh, to get there. And then it's a question of, um, you know, I mean, it's, it's working out a lot of the, uh, the issues. And, and, and again, I mean, I think ideally this isn't the healthcare sector like saying this is what we need for us to accomplish our goals and therefore human services sector you need to provide this data to us in this format etc it's you know the two sectors coming together under perhaps some other you know Kathleen keeps talking about governance some you know broader governance um, that is thinking about the best interests overall 
of how we connect these disparate data systems. We're seeing, you know, we're seeing things like HIEs trying to expand in that direction. Uh, we're seeing, I, I think this this rise in these uh, private technologies, Ambertha, et cetera, to to create those electronic connections is 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 another way that we're seeing that. Um, but I think um, uh, there's there is really um, uh, we're moving in that direction. But I think some additional big picture investments and thinking about it from a public policy perspective would really be helpful to to make that jump. Curious to hear if others have other thoughts. So we run an HIE in Camden, and um, I agree with you about the investment, although my one concern, which is would not get in the way of my saying big investment. So by the way, I just want to say that is that. Um, you know, high tech resulted in health systems spending billions of dollars and we can bring a shelter on our HIE for eight thousand dollars a year. It's eight thousand dollars a year. I mean, and by the way, some of our shelters can't afford that. So I have a grant right now to bring them on. I have one of our local food service agencies now is on our HIE and it's limited what they're allowed to see. But they now know if someone that they're delivering meals to has been hospitalized. Right. So there's actually very inexpensive ways we can do this. And what I'm worried about sometimes when those federal level things happen is they completely obliterate the what's happening on the ground, how inexpensively we can do some of this. Big venture funds come in. Um, and, um, and so I just hope that we can do it um, in a way that's like homegrown and that pays attention to what's really needed because I don't think that a lot of these places need um, fancy electronic medical records, right? Um, but they need access to some things. And I think we have models and growing models out there of the things that can be really, really helpful. I mean, in the shelter, training two shelter staff to use our HIE to get consent from shelter, um, you know, people staying at the shelter, um, so that they're more confident about the meds they give out. I mean, we're talking about non-health staff giving out meds, right? Um, so there's really, really simple things we can do that aren't as, ex as expensive. We still need the big investment, but I just hope it doesn't result in a sort of overdoing it. Um, and so that's my one comment about that. So we're unfortunately getting very close to the top of the hour. So I wanna end with one last question for each of you. We've talked a little bit about um, the role of the healthcare system in addressing um, social determinants of health uh, and what the right level of involvement is in that. Um, and there's you know, some thoughts that um, there are trade-offs with, in, with integrating social service um, organizations too uh, deeply into the healthcare system. Um, and there's some like political and financial power differentials between the groups. I wondered if uh, each of you could uh, give like a one minute answer on where you think the right lane is for the healthcare system and how we can get there. It's a lot to answer in one minute, but I know you guys are up to it. Um, Jorge, maybe I can start with you if that's okay. I say we learn from Elon Musk. Like what? Oh, you know, let's think boldly. And boldly, I like what Kathleen, you were saying. Boldly doesn't mean pouring millions of dollars in, into one thing, but think, thinking at the in, intersection of the big picture and the, the little solutions, not just one way to, to think about um, everything. But if, if Elon Musk can think, imagine building a hotel in space, uh, we can imagine how to fix some of these things on Earth. And I think it's, it's less about Imagining we look look at all the examples that were discussed just, just here and I see there were about 300 participants and I'm sure most of them are in, embedded in ways and have ideas and we it's I, I, I go back to the advocacy the political will to to uh, to do the things we know that needs to be done. So if I may conclude my minute I implore all of us to not let the failure of imagination the lack of political will and our primordial instinct of self-preservation and profit hoarding limit what we can do. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I think that we have a great opportunity with um, some of the big dollars that are being promised um, that are going to be pumped into public health um, departments around the country. And I think that um, 
what I hope is that the hospitals and so many of them are stepping up and stepping up more, I think, um, around COVID, that, um, that there's some plan at the state level to really think about bringing in hospitals um, to think about what their lane is as we build out the public health system, right? Because that hasn't been done before. And um, that just gives us an opportunity. So I, I hope that that's not a public health only thing and that the hospital systems actually welcome being sort of invited in um, as a participant, but not necessarily as a leader in figuring out like what to do with um, dollars that are going to be allocated to build out a public health infrastructure. I would say I hope that they um, they continue to want to talk about these issues and that they like just welcome being invited into something where they're not necessarily the lead. Yeah, um, I, I agree with uh, both of the other um, presenters. Um, the, the way that I think about it is that health, our health system, healthcare system, its role um, is to help um, generate health, maximize health for all of us. Um, and so I think within that role, the healthcare sector has to be thinking about social factors because of the impact that they have on health. I think that they have a, um, a range of potential roles in that, but go, I think, from the, I think when you're talking about the health care that is being provided to a particular individual, um, there is a need to think about how so addressing social risks uh, helps you provide the best health care possible for that patient. Um, and then there's a continuum of kind of roles and responsibilities, I think, of kind of, um, you know, in that role, the healthcare care sector is the that's that's the primary role, I think. You know, as you get further and further out, the role shifts from being, you know, the the primary driver, I think, to being more of the supporter, participant, et cetera, um, collaborator role that, that I think Kathleen is talking about. Um, and so I think we have a spectrum of roles. Um, and um, and I think what's exciting is that we are right now at a time where um, we are seeing so much experimentation and um, and we. At, I think, like Jorge mentioned, there's a lot possible um, that that we are um, going to be seeing more of in the future. Well, thank you. Uh, I think that's a great optimistic note to end on. I want to thank all of you for joining me today. It was a great conversation, and I enjoyed it very much. I'm sure our audience did as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for attending. Take care.